An artist's duty, as far as I'm concerned, is to reflect the times. I think that is true of, of, of painters, sculptors, poets, musicians, but I choose to reflect the times and the situations in which I find myself. That to me is my duty. I, and, and, and at this crucial time in our lives, when everything is so desperate, when every day is a matter of survival, I don't think you can help but be involved. We will shape and mold this country or it will not be molded and shaped at all. That was singer, songwriter and activist Nina Simone, speaking of art as a powerful tool to create change. But is Nina being idealistic? Are the arts more about entertaining than changing the world? According to the UK government, which recently imposed a 50% funding cut to art and design higher education courses, the answer is yes. Their response to those criticising the decision is that the funding is needed to support subjects that more closely align to the economy and their strategic objectives. And as the country seeks to recover from the social and economic costs of an unprecedented pandemic, are they right to suggest that, in today's world, the arts are just less valuable than subjects like science and technology? Welcome to LSE IQ, the podcast where we ask social scientists and other experts to answer one intelligent question. I'm Jess Winterstein from the IQ team, where we work with academics to bring you their latest research and ideas. In this episode, I ask, do we need the arts to change the world? I'll be talking to researchers who have stepped outside the confines of the traditional academic paper to create change, finding out what a fictional beauty brand has to do with fertility law, why Georgian prostitutes inspired an audio drama, and how a card game is challenging people to think about urban design. What changes would you bring to your neighbourhood to encourage people to rest and relax in public spaces? So if you I have, have a comfort one, you can play here. One. Yeah, that's an exception you can play. Ah, so, so it counts as that, one of your five. Yeah, okay. I don't have a comfort. Yeah? You don't either. Public toilets is a good comfort. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have those in the UK. This is true, this is true. Actually, I'm sitting in a marquee in LSE's public square. Having come to hear about research into the use of public spaces in Kuwait, I find myself studying a hand of cards, searching for ways to help my character successfully navigate the residential Kuwaiti neighbourhood of Katuba. Others are focused on the more urban city of Salmia. There are tools to use and decisions to be made, depending on how the cards are drawn. It's a fun game, but one with a serious point. We understood that the availability of land and the availability of oil, in Kuwait in particular, led to a car-centric development that somehow leaves people and experience of public space on the side. So it prioritizes roads and it prioritizes motorized development rather than prioritizing how people experience public space and public space itself. I'm speaking to LSE City's researcher, Dr. Alexandra Gomez, one of the principal investigators of a project exploring how public areas like streets, parks and open spaces are being used in Kuwait and one of the brains behind the Kuwaitscapes card game. A lot of these neighbourhoods are built in Kuwait and their local uh, public spaces are neglected and streets are occupied by cars. So sidewalks, when they exist, they are occupied by cars. So cars occupy the sidewalk and people walk in the streets and that has a lot of impact. It has impact at the city level with pollution, of course, and the fact that people, in particular Kuwaitis, who have access to cheap oil and, and cars, that drive and therefore there's problems with obesity tea with asthma and diabetes but at the same time you're also not promoting the, the the basic infrastructure for those who have to walk in the streets those who work in the streets that are not non kuwaitis that are low income workers they have to use the infrastructure and the infrastructure is not ready for them to use the research identified ways that public spaces could be improved to influence healthier behavior and more environmentally friendly mobility Findings helpful for city planners and policymakers, but perhaps less directly relevant to those who just enjoy a good card game. And while projects like this do usually generate policy papers and journal articles, less often do researchers find themselves designing playing cards and strategising game moves. Kuwaitscapes, aimed at children aged 10 and above, challenges players to be the first to improve an area for their character. I asked Alexandra how it came about. 
we wanted to create a game that somehow would bring awareness to public space use, which was what came up from the research project. Each card that represents a space has its own needs of tools that you know can improve the, those particular spaces, from transport-related tools to public toilets to zebras and pavement. And we also have social tools that allow people to engage with their neighbors and with, with friends. So we have, for example, street food markets and we have uh, yoga in the park. Players play as one of 14 diverse characters a mother, toddler, street cleaner, or tourist, to name a few. Alongside the tools, there are also action cards, which can throw up obstacles like pollution or traffic, and nudge cards created to help players understand the potential impact of their decisions. With the combination of spaces, tools, and characters, we try to create a game that somehow creates the awareness for how to improve public space, what are the tools that we can use, what are the tools that are missing now, and you know, uh, create a bit of empathy by different people who are not only us, you know, not only you that are the teacher or you that are the mother, but are also other people who have different needs from yours. We also have, for example, a street cleaner, which is someone who is permanently in the streets, but it's not catered for usually in planning. We decided that we wanted to create something more graphical and more visual that could make people think about their own situation and the situation of others. We wanted to highlight planning, urban design and individual behaviour uh, factors and how these intertwine because, you know, they are all connected. You cannot walk if you don't have the infrastructure, so you can't change behaviour if there's no infrastructure. And without mixed use, you know, where are you walking to? <laughs> so you can improve public space, but then if there's nothing in public space, then, you know, there's a, a connection between all these elements. A card game has the potential to reach a, a sort of much wider and more diverse audience than an academic paper. And how important is it to you that you reach these different groups of people? I think it's fundamental, right? Who who reads an academic paper or an academic report and, and then looking to who can use a game of cards. Our aim was to influence uh, policy making in Kuwait and we created the policy report. So we thought the card game would influence the other side. <laughs> and we focused on, on children, 10 years plus. So the goal is that, you know, we start from the beginning and we influence the new generation, which has, you know, has a, an impact all over the world. And you can see with climate change and what's happening with the, the younger generation. So we wanted that. We wanted to create something that can influence a new generation in Kuwait. We can also engage with a larger population and audience that would not read a policy report. And who knows, they can start questioning, they can start walking in the streets and paying more attention to details and thinking, why don't we have a zebra? Or <laughs> uh, why is uh, there no, there's no pedestrian traffic signal? Or why don't I have a public toilet in this particular park? So that I think we can reach a different type of audience, but they, they can help us changing Kuwait in a way and improving the way planning is being done in, in Kuwait in particular. Dr. Gomez has spun her academic research into a card game for the whole family. So what does she think of the suggestion that the arts are maybe not as necessary as other skills in today's world? I think communication is as important as the content in a way, because without communication, how can you uh, make people be aware or read it or be interested in or engage with it, right? So I find this idea that communication is less important is not true. The whole visual, the whole detail is almost as important as the content of the cards because that's what allows QATs to engage. This is a real space. These are people that could be real. And this is within the cards. But then you have all the outputs of projects that can be visualized. The way you create a map can influence people to discuss something or to argue something. You know, you can have a map that represents a whole A4 of text. More people would pay attention to a, a nice visual map infographic than a page of text. I'm not saying the map is more important than the text, but a lot of the times the link between both is fundamental. And that's what we wanted to do here too. It was to link policy and research with something that, you know, it interests other type, 
type of people, the same type of people, but it reaches a wider audience. You know, I'm not an artist. My background is in engineering <laughs> uh, with a bit of sociology and a bit of urban design. Having an artist or having art being linked to other social sciences, even biology, even other sciences, I think it's fundamental when you're trying to explain to the wider audience what you're doing. Alexandra hopes that Kuwaitscapes will help connect a wider audience to her specialist subject of urban planning. Taking a less visual, but no less creative approach to sharing his work is Patrick Wallace, a professor of economic history at LSE. His discovery of a document, found during a hunt for teaching material at the London Metropolitan Archive, led to The Lock Asylum, an original audio play produced in collaboration with writers Cara Jennings and Sophie Trott. The drama shines a light on some of the women whose lives are recorded in the document. Patrick explains. So the Lock Asylum is... uh quite an unusual institution that's created in the 1780s in London. And what it exists for is to try and um, essentially redeem women who have been just treated for syphilis in a lock hospital, a lock hospital which had been running since the 1740s. Sorry. Sorry for all the dates. No, no. Um, you're an economic historian. You're allowed to have I'm dates. I'm an economic historian. <laughs> I, I, love the, I love the time and the period. So um, it's an institution that was created to essentially redeem and reform women who had often spent time working as prostitutes, had fallen in the idea, in the view of the people of the time, um, and to give them sanctuary and to take them into a, into a world of prayer, a world of reflection, and then eventually to um, send them off to lives as servants or maybe back to their family, where they would be saved, essentially, from the sins that had previously exposed them to syphilis or other sexually transmitted diseases. There is only one bed today. Please. I need a place to lay in, then get out and back to work. I still look young. You're 25. Most prostitutes are dead by your age. So these are young women, many of them are poor, many of them migrants. They come to London, um, often with ambition to maybe work as a servant or to spend time with, with someone. Sometimes they think they're settling down with a husband, and yet something goes wrong. Many of them then end up as prostitutes. Others um, lose their money, they have their husbands run away, and they're essentially left on the streets with nothing and suffering from syphilis, which is at that point a, a terminal and horrific disease. So these are, these are people that you empathize with. And for our students, you know, they're of the same age, right? These are people, these are women in their late teens, their 20s, they're migrants, so are most of our students. And they're experiencing sexual violence, they're experiencing loss and hardship. And that's the kind of contrast with life that you want to kind of offer to students to make them think about the varieties of experiences in history. So you brought in younger people uh, interested as well. It wasn't just actors, was it? The idea of taking this to, to people who are even younger than our own students seemed to us to be to be a kind of great way of, of challenging young actors to think about these things. And you can present a, a 17-year-old with a, the life history of someone who was 15, 16, 17 in the 1780s who'd had these experiences. I think it really changes how they think about history because they're no longer thinking about these kind of big, broad summaries of, of life. The Industrial Revolution or the Napoleonic Wars, they're, they're, they're dealing with an individual, a, a person who they've got their name, they know their background and they know what happened to them a little bit and then they have to build a frame around that. I think that's, that's a really good challenge for, for thinking about difference, for thinking about experience. What would you say to the arguments that perhaps these women's histories aren't of such importance? What relevance do their lives have to us today? So to me, this is the lives of the majority of people in the past. Women make up half the population. The poor make up the great majority of the population. And these are lives that matter to the individuals. They're lives that matter to us because they talk to us about the experiences of people on the margins of society. And they're also lives that get caught up in institutions and policies and activities that even today continue to shape the experience of women who are living outside of society's norms. The kind of institutions we're talking about here are ones that carry on acting and intervening for the next 200 years. And as soon as you start reading these stories, you start to wonder what else is going on here? What happens next? 
what were the what was the view of the women that they weren't maybe presenting to the officials in the hospital and these there are these huge gaps around the evidence that we have and you can only fill those imaginatively and it seemed to me that this was just a a wonderful way to try and think about what um a collaboration with artists and creative thinkers and historians might might help us see about the possibilities of the past, essentially. For Patrick, the creative process of fictionalising the women of the Lock Asylum brought a new depth to his approach as a historian. He hopes, too, that the dramatic telling of these women's lives will also encourage a wider audience to think more deeply about the attitudes facing women today. Here's Patrick. One of the things we were trying to do here was actually reach different audiences. The idea was to reach a kind of wider slice of the community and get them to think a little bit about what the past might tell them about the continuities and changes to the present. What do you think we might lose if those more creative skills of translating research into perhaps a more accessible medium is lessened? This is one of the most exciting things I've done in my career. It's really just fun and interesting but I think it is incredibly valuable and if the wider infrastructure and the environment is is lost then we would simply thin out our capacity to create new fascinating interesting works of art works of scholarship and build the relationship between the two I, I think to me it's just it's just the way to learn isn't it you to really get a sense of the past, you need to look at the records, you need to think about the lives of the people that are in them, and you need to start to connect that into some kind of imagined world in your mind. Hi, I'm interrupting this episode of LSE IQ to let you know where you can find even more amazing LSE content. Our public lectures are free to attend and feature some of the most influential figures in the social sciences. To listen to past events, search LSE Lectures and Events wherever you get your podcasts and visit lse.ac.uk forward slash events to check out our upcoming programme. Now, back to IQ. You're listening to LSE IQ. In this programme, we're asking, do we need the arts to change the world? We've heard how games and drama are being used to create empathy, build understanding and develop the next generation of historians and urban planners. One expert, however, has taken a more immersive approach. Emily Jackson is a professor of law at LSE, with a specific focus on reproductive issues. Her research into the length of time women's eggs can be stored has led to a change in UK legislation, with an act currently working its way through Parliament. Presently, frozen sperm, eggs and embryos must be destroyed after 10 years. Because women become less fertile as they grow older, this means they are faced with a difficult choice either freeze higher quality eggs that might need to be destroyed before they're wanted, or lower quality ones at a time better suited for pregnancy. Professor Jackson has successfully argued that the 10-year time limit should be increased. She explains. There's this new option, which is sometimes described as social egg freezing. So that's where a woman doesn't have any reason to be concerned about her fertility, but she is worried that maybe she hasn't yet met the right person, it's not the right time in her life to have a baby now but she thinks she might want to have one in the future so she freezes her eggs almost as a bit of an insurance policy so that if she tries to have IVF later when she's say 43 or 44 she has eggs that she froze when she was younger available to her and a much much higher chance of success. So 10 years doesn't work for this group of patients because if you freeze your eggs because you're worried about the fact that you haven't find met a the right person yet, you're not ready to have a child. If you freeze them maybe when you're 25, you don't want them destroyed at 35 because they're more likely to be useful to you in your early 40s. So the 10 year limit then creates this real problem for women who freeze their eggs and then find out that those, and have to pay for it, it's not not a cheap process, and they have to pay for storage, which also isn't cheap. And then they find after 10 years, the clinic writes to them and say, I'm afraid the legislation says we have to destroy your eggs. And of course, For many women, this has been incredibly distressing Um, and it's also pointless because there's no good, there's no health reason for destruction, there's no social policy reason for destruction. Um, So it was an anomaly that needed to be fixed. And finally, um, after considerable pressure, the government have accepted the need for a change in the law. 
The pop-up shop gave people the opportunity to browse what looked like high-end beauty products, but were in fact props designed to encourage people to think about fertility. Open briefly at Old Street Station, it's a departure from the normal output you might expect from an eminent law professor. I asked Emily what visitors were faced with when popping in to find out more about the Timeless brand. This is, I think, one of the most exciting things I've, I've been involved in, um, in in my career. It was completely different from anything else I've done before. So I worked with a creative agency called The Liminal Space, um, and we worked together um, on this pop-up shop. And what it was is it was, um, it was, it was designed to look, and it did look, very much like a, somewhere selling high-end beauty products. But it, was, it wasn't selling anything. Um, it was a, a kind of awareness, public education facility. So as you walked in, on the wall was this graph, which was made up of the sort of vials you get in, sort of test tubes that you get in laboratories. Um, and these were filled with red liquid. And across the top, there was, there was a, um, women's ages, basically, from 12 to 50. And the vials had, uh, they'd done this accurately, uh, an amount of li- red liquid in, which represented the amount of eggs that a woman would have in her ovaries. And what this demonstrated in this incredibly hard-hitting way was quite how how rapid and massive fertility loss is. So obviously at 12, these, these, these test tubes were quite full. At 50, they were empty. There were also products which you could pick up and look at which had issues that people could talk about or, or discuss. Um, so they had a range of perfumes which were called things, like, I remember one was called Oh So Pressured, E-A-O, um, which was talking about the ticking biological clock. Visitors would have been presented with a wall of attractively designed bottles, each offering a diminishing amount of product as the labelled age grew older. It's a simple yet dramatic way to illustrate how women's fertility decreases as they age. Looking at pictures, it's striking how much Timeless emulated to the smallest detail a high-end beauty boutique. Replace the faux shop with a pamphlet stand, and I can't help but wonder if people would have even stopped to pick one up. I asked Emily how people reacted when discovering they weren't going to leave with a purchase. Lots of men who came into the shop, because I think people were curious, it looked quite, it looked quite um, appealing. People didn't know what it was. Um, I think lots of men who came in said, goodness me, I had no idea. I, I get it, because I think some of these men, their partners have probably been talking to them about need to have a baby. But this, this visual thing of just quite how March of Women's, women's Fertility has already declined was, was visually very striking. And it wasn't just people thinking about parenthood who engaged with the topic. One of the most exciting groups of people who came in to have a look at this were a group of secondary school boys, teenage boys, uh, who, whose biology teacher had sent them down on a biology trip uh, for a local school, a biology trip outing to go and uh, find out more about fertility. The other thing which was really interesting is how many people came in not because they were interested in egg freezing for themselves, but because they wanted grandchildren. There were a lot of potential grandparents who were awfully interested in, in this. It was just really interesting. We've heard how academic collaboration and artistic creativity are being used not just to entertain, but to inform, educate and engage a diverse group of people. So why, despite this, are the arts still viewed by many as being primarily only good for entertainment? Professor Julia Black, Head of Innovation at LSE and President of the British Academy, has been concerned about the devaluing of certain subjects for some time. She's spearheading a new campaign which aims to challenge this perception. Shape, or Social Sciences, Humanities and the Arts for People and the Economy or the Environment, aims to champion these subjects as being as important as STEM ones, that's science, technology, engineering and mathematics, in helping to build a better world. I asked her why she felt a campaign like Shape was needed, and if there might be anything to the idea that these quote-unquote softer subjects might just be less important in today's world. The idea behind Shape is first of all to provide a, if you like, a common term for our disciplines to enable a a narrative uh, to be told. So we've already got STEM, which emerged, what, 30 years ago, and that's been quite successful in enabling people to think about the natural and physical sciences as a bundle. 
and for STEM to to tell its story, as it were, that they're about the exploration of the natural and the physical world. Whereas for arts, humanities, social sciences, we don't have such a narrative. Uh, we have different descriptors. The term arts, for example, in the US refers to something different than it does in the UK. You've got different understandings of social sciences and humanities. You've got kind of, well, where do different disciplines fit? It's really about explaining, well, what's distinctive about social sciences, arts and humanities? And it is that they are the understanding and study and expression of people and societies across time and space. And that is essentially what those subjects are about. They're about understanding, they're about interpreting, they're about inquiring, investigating, they're about expressing. But it's always about people and societies across time and space. What's your response to the argument that STEM subjects are just more directly applicable to the world we live in today? My answer to that is that we live in an 80% services economy in the UK. And if we look at the phases of, of economic development, then we had the first industrial revolution, which was about manufacturing, etc. We've had the second, we've had the third. And the third was based fundamentally around communications. And the fourth is fundamentally around digital. And in terms of where our disciplines sit within the economy, they fuel the legal system. They fuel the financial services system. They fuel marketing. They fuel understanding this consumer behaviour. And then if you were to look at specific sectors, then the fastest growing area of our economy at the moment is the creative industries. And that is powered and fueled by our creative arts, but also working in conjunction with technology, working in conjunction with STEM, absolutely. But you can't have one without the other. So those two together are absolutely critical to one of the fastest growing areas of our economy today, the creative industries. What do you think the impact to society could be if, if these subjects do continue to be devalued or we diminish the expertise we currently have through a lack of education and opportunity? I think it could be really damaging. Think about a day that you go through your life where there's been no shape involvement in anything that you do. First of all, you've got no content to watch on Netflix. Okay, You've got no books to read. You've got no art to go and see. You've got no music to listen to. You probably don't have many consumer products because they haven't been marketed to you. You don't have a legal system. You don't have a financial system. So these are really quite fundamental things. We also need to understand governance. We need to understand regulation. We need to understand that critical engagement with the data. And we need that absolutely. And we need it right now. We need it very urgently. Even if you just look at the popularity of history. You know, history programmes. I was at the British Museum yesterday. It was half term. British Museum was absolutely packed. There were families there, there were kids of all ages. That was just fantastic. And you think people, people are really interested. And why is that not valuable in its own right? And yes, we monetize it as well. We can monetize it if that's the thing that really counts. Oh, we want to make count, but actually people are genuinely interested to understand how people lived before us. People in societies across time and place. What's not interesting about that? The arts undoubtedly have the power to entertain, but do we need them to change the world? Let's put it another way. While they can appear frivolous, what might the world look like if the ability to communicate is lost? Whether it's raising public awareness, pushing for a change in legislation, encouraging new ideas, or simply generating empathy and understanding, it seems to me that the arts, along with the social sciences and humanities, are a key part in helping us understand the world, and in doing so, shape a better future. This episode was produced by me, Jess Winterstein, with editing by Natalie Abbott and Oliver Johnson. If you'd like to find out more about the research in this episode, head to the show notes. And if you enjoy LSEIQ, please leave us a review. Coming up soon on LSEIQ, we'll be revisiting a previous episode, Why Do We Need Food Banks? 